me out to the ball game. Take me out with the crowd. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Green Grass and White Bases podcast. We're joined today by current baseball warehouse coach Hondo Diaz. Hondo is a Old Bridge High School alum. He's also a Southern New Hampshire alum. In high school at Old Bridge, he was second team all county in the GMC. His team won the conference championship, and he was both a team MVP and his team's captain. Moving on to his college career, Hondo was third team all NE10 twice. He had four homers, 115 hits, and a career batting average of 301. So staying above that 300 line, certainly impressive through a four-year college career. Um, we're super excited to have him join the show today and, uh, and just get into it. We've, uh, we've front-ended the podcast so far with a lot of pitching minds and, uh, and pitchers, whether it be current active guys or guys that are on the coaching side of the game now. So we're excited to get into it and talk some hitting with Hondo today. And um, any more bio stuff that you have, man, introduce yourself and anything I missed, feel free to add. No, I mean, I think you pretty much hit it. Um, excited to be on. I've listened to every um, podcast so far. Thank you. Um, definitely a lot of pitching side and glad to come in and be on the hitting side or defense side that um, maybe we haven't touched on yet. So, yeah, definitely yeah, excited. Yeah, so here at the warehouse, Hondo works a ton with our hitters. He works a ton with our infielders and our defense. So uh, just kind of adding that perspective to the game that we've missed thus far in our first couple episodes here. So I guess at this point, uh, no better time than to just jump right into it. So I think the first thing, I know you and I have a lot of conversations about things to work on with kids and lessons, things that we work on with our teams when it comes to hitting. What are like two or three or four pillars that you really focus on when it comes to teaching hitting? Yeah, so I think everybody's unique. You know, there's no one cookie cutter way to do it. Um, you know, now there are some positions that I stress. And I think one of the pillars you're asking for, to me, positioning is, is important. Um, if we don't get to good positions, we can't expect to put a good swing on the ball um, consistently. You know, now, again, we can be off balance, still get a hit here and there, but that's not being consistent. That's not getting to a spot where, you know, I feel comfortable, I feel powerful, and I feel like I could re repeatedly be on time. So. Um, that's definitely one, you know, good positioning. Um, vision is always important, you know, being able to, when we're on deck or we're watching the pitcher warm up, really get a, a good sight of what the pitcher's doing, where his arm slot is, how quick is he to the plate, um, watching them when they're, um, when there's guys on base and they're coming out of the stretch, you know, how quick are they? Um, so vision is important. Um, balance is always important, you know, and to touch on balance, Coach Garlotti here always stress is, you know, uh, rhythm, balance, and timing. You know, those three things are when he goes out and goes to watch high school players, college players, and even some of the minor league guys, you know, those three things he always stresses. And I learned that when I was here playing for the warehouse with him. And I always thought about that during my playing days and now being able to do it from the other side on the coaching side, you know, those three things are always important. And, you know, if we can really stress those things and guys can get really good at that, you know, they have a better chance to be successful. Right. No doubt. I think the consistency piece is always interesting. I think uh, even in my experience, there's a lot of things where we'll talk about getting in those good, good positions and lessons. And then it seems like we break it back down and we go to more of a live setting, whether it's off the machine or throwing live to guys. And it turns into a couple good ones. And then we try to do too much and we try to hit a bomb once we start to feeling good. So what's kind of your theory around that where I know I've struggled personally with convincing guys that if we do something well, the goal has to be to repeat it after that consistency goal that we're after. So what's, what's your theory? What's your breakdown on that and telling guys, listen, the things that work are going to work, but we have to make sure we apply them instead of trying to do too much. Yeah, I, I think when we get into like a lesson setting or even a team setting where you're getting a round of six or eight, it's easy to have two really good swings and then say, you know, those were two doubles. Now I'm going to try to hit a homer. And now instead of hitting a homer, I pop it up in the infield, you know, trying to do too much is not always the best, right? You always hear the term less is more, um, be consistent. Again, going back to the word consistent, if we're, if I'm hitting two doubles, let me hit a third and a fourth double in a cage, or even in BP on a field, um, doing something like that to allow yourself to stay in control, you know, have body awareness, barrel control while you're practicing so that the more you do that now, that muscle memory builds up. So when it comes to a game, I'm not trying to do that fourth swing of trying to hit a homer. Now I'm just staying consistent and, you know, letting the velocity of the pitch and me being on time, maybe I run into a homer there by trying to hit a single or a double. Right, right. I think 
I think it's important to think like in those terms, like good swings can lead to homers, mm -hmm. right? Like it's tough to think that a home run swing is going to lead us to a homer on a consistent basis. But if we can get that muscle memory, like you're saying, of just developing a good swing and putting ourselves in good positions, then that's when the homers come in. I know my high school coach used to say, you're going to hit homers when the stars align and the planets are in the right order and that kind of thing. We never, you know, it's the toughest part of baseball that we well, you never. Said it. You said it in my, uh, my stats. I hit four homers in college. I wasn't a home run hitter. And I know for those four home runs I hit, I was not trying to hit a home run. None of them were towering shots. They were balls that I hit on a line that had backspin that went over the fence. Right. You know, I was never trying to hit a home run. I think the big difference now is when you watch the big league game, they teach guys to try to hit homers only because the analytics say, you know, a homer and a strikeout's okay. You know, a single and no one gets you around or to put three singles together is a little harder. But if I hit a homer here, I get, that ensures us a run. Right. So it, it's kind of hard to teach kids that because they're not they don't have the power or the size to do that on a consistent basis as some of these, you know, big league players. Right. So I think in that vein, right, there's been a lot of like new school stuff that's come to the forefront in the game today. Guys trying to I hate to put it so harshly, but reinvent the wheel in a, in a certain respect of how hitting is supposed to happen based on the analytics, based on the way the game is evolving. So what are your thoughts on some of the more traditional stuff like like we've learned from Coach Garlotti and the guys around here at the baseball warehouse coming up where it's about the rhythm, the timing, and the balance compared to this new school stuff with the true outcomes or whatever it is they call it in the big leagues these days where it's home run, strikeout, or bust? What's your yeah, mindset I mean, around that? I, th I think a combination of both is important. You know, I – you know, to this day, I still say that my dad taught me a lot about hitting and, you know, he's very old school, you know, this is how it should be done, blah, blah, blah. And we worked on stuff. And to this day, he could watch me swing and say, that's not your swing. Right. You know, you know, I know what your swing should look like, you know, and, you know, to have a little bit of both where, you know, the science side or the analytics side still comes into play and learning how to use your body correctly um, but then also the fundamentals are never going to change, right? You know, those things are always going to be consistent. You know, there's a great picture out there that I saw on Instagram that it's probably like 20 MLB guys and it shows them all in their loaded position right now. They all probably started different, but they're all in the same exact spot. Right. Right. And it goes back to like, you have Babe Ruth, Mickey Mantle on there, Manny Ramirez, Judge, you have all these guys who from back in the 60s, 70s time to now, that they're all in the same exact spot. So that kind of stuff like shouldn't change. You know, people try to teach the launch angle stuff. Now, I'm not saying it's wrong, right? Because again, I'm not saying I know everything about hitting and of I'm course. the expert, but at the end of the day, you got to teach it to the individual, not to what you think only works or you think will work for everybody. Right. And I think that individualization is really important because like you're saying, all those guys have their own personal swing that they've custom tailored to themselves. But where the fundamentals come back in there is when it's time to go, when we're loaded and we're, it's time to swing through that baseball, everybody should end up in the same position. In the same position for the most part. Right. Right. Um, I think at the end of the day, guys knowing how their body works, um, you got a guy who's a little taller, lankier, you know, his, his load may be or take a little longer than a guy who's a little stockier. Right. right. Their movement may be a little less. But at the end of the day, if we can get to a good, strong position, that's going to allow us to put the best swing on the ball. Yeah, that, I mean, that makes a lot of sense. Like, if we're getting strong, we're going to be able to hit the ball in a strong manner, too. And that, that, you know, the math checks out there for sure. Whether or not we're talking new school launch angle, home runner bust type of stuff, or we're talking more old school traditional fundamental stuff, I think everybody should be able to agree that if we can get ourselves into strong positions as hitters, we should be able to do some damage on that baseball. Yeah, for sure. And I think, like, even today, I had a couple lessons and all different age groups, all different skill levels. And one group, we move very fast, where I've been working with these two guys for probably four to five years now. They're seniors, you know, Justin Batts and Charlie Taub. I've been hitting with you guys for a while. Right. They know what they're supposed to feel, how they're supposed to move on, and you saw them move on and progress. And you see them make adjustments from cues or thoughts that we talk about for the last four or five years. Right. You see them move on from T-work to flips to even getting off the machine and seeing some velo. Right. Now, I had someone come in later who's a little younger. Right. We stayed on the tee for 50 minutes, but for him, it was more important to really understand the feeling of making sure I'm in the right spot. You know, it's really easy if I said, here, let's just go on the machine. He probably wouldn't have learned as much as he did in that 50 minute session that we had. Um, so for him now, it's I tell him, hey, you have homework now. Right. right. Yeah, we sat here for an hour. Maybe it wasn't the most fun session that we had, 
But for you, you learn stuff. You learn how your body, what you should feel in your body, know, know the position you got to, and he still saw some results. Right. Now, his dad was back there with us, and, and he was saying, like, wow, that was really good. Right. He needed something like that. He needed to slow down a little bit versus wanting to go fast, fast, fast. You know, he was able to slow down and kind of get the feel. And like his last 10 swings were really good. You know, now we feed off that into our next session as long as he continues to work on it at home. Absolutely. And I think the important part of that is to talk about like Charlie, the Charlie Taubes and the Justin Vats kind of guys that come through our program and have been here since they were 12 years old. And now they're 18 year old seniors that are moving on to college careers. Right. So that. I think as it compares to what we're talking about with the individualization compared to the fundamentals, right? As we get older, we can kind of start to separate ourselves into what we need personally. And then when we talk to those younger guys, that's where kind of those fundamentals start to come in. And I guess that's not life changing to say Mm -hmm. that the younger guys need to work on the fundamentals. But I know you and I had a conversation off the air a couple of days ago now talking about what that good position on the tee feels like. So I know we're talking about a comparison to what big leaguers do these days. And a lot of those guys will say when they're interviewed that they spend a ton of time on the tee. But I think the guys that come here are under the impression that tee work is something that little kids do when they don't know how to hit yet. So if you could take us through like what your approach is when it comes to, you know, I'm sure some people are saying, how do you spend 50 minutes on the tee? Yeah. I obviously we're not going to talk all 50 minutes on what you'd go through, but just Run us through what it what it looks like and what you're trying to accomplish in those 50 minutes off the tee. Sure. So I think it depends on who it is because um, I'll get new guys here and there. Some are older, some are younger. Um, but like the first thing I do with every lesson, no matter who it is, is I set the tee up or I let them set the tee up just to kind of see where they position it, where their point of contact is, where they're lined up and start to analyze. And I tell them, all right, just hit, you know, 10 swings. Just try to hit the ball off the back net. And I kind of watch their moves, see where they load, see their positioning, see their stride, where are their hands set up, right? So again, you could break down a swing into a hundred different things and a hundred different thought processes that now we got to work on them. You know, if something's not working right or we're not loaded correctly or we're not, we're not getting into our back hip or we're drifting, right? We can sit, sit back. I can demonstrate, you know, that's the other thing I try to do is figure out how these kids learn. Everybody's a different type of learner. Some people have to do it hands on. Some people are visual. So, you know, I use all these things in the back to try to help them and see what really clicks. Right. Everybody's different. Everybody has to have their own way of learning. So what I try to tell them to do with me so I can help them better is have them understand what clicks. You know, so if I say to you, you know, really make sure you're getting into your back hip, that just word getting into your back hip. Now, all of a sudden they're trying to do that and I see them doing it well. Now I know for future times when we hit, I say, hey, remember, back hit. Right. And now they know automatically that clicks with them. Um, so I know you said 50 minutes sounds like a lot in the tee, but sometimes I'll blink and I'll look at my, my watch and I'm like, oh, the hour's up already. Right. You know, but we got a lot of work in, even though we haven't moved from the tee. Right. You know, and who knows, maybe we'll go through a bucket or two. Sometimes we go through 20 swings, right? But sometimes the dry work, the functional movements that we make, I take guys out here and use the med ball toss. Uh, I have that water bag, you know, I I use the PVC pipe. I use all these tools just for guys to really try to get to a good spot, really for them to understand what they should feel, right? I use the bands in the back to really help them load their hip or their back knee. So there's a lot of tools I use that try to get guys to really feel what they're doing, you know? So even though it's an hour lesson or 50 minute lesson, whatever it may be, and we haven't moved from the T, we get a lot done. But the goal is that's this week. Next week, I want to move on. Right. Because right? there's more than just the hitting on the tee, even though I think tee is important. And like you said, everybody's different. So you'll, you'll go on MLB Network and you'll see, you know, Albert Pujols talking about how he hits on the tee. And he's saying how he likes to set the tee up really deep because he knows if he can hit that ball, he can hit every other ball out front. You know, and then other guys are like, oh, I like the tee all the way out front because I want to feel my back get through the zone. Right. So everybody's different. Everybody likes their own styles. Um, I try to change it up depending on who I'm working with and what they need to work on. Yeah. So like I said, everybody's different. Everybody has a different plan. There's no cookie cutter way where we come in and say, this is what everybody's doing. You know? Yeah. That's certainly something that I picked up watching you give lessons, watching Joe give lessons when I first started here was throughout the lessons that we give or throughout a practice or whatever that we might be coaching. The goal is kind of provide the kids or the athletes, whoever with a hundred different cues, hoping that one or two of them clicks. So I think that's where the value comes in with, you know, we have the water bag, we have the PVC pipes, we have the 
platforms that we might put their back foot or their front foot on. We have these different positions with the T that we can use because if both of these kids have a goal of getting into their back hip better, how the first hitter feels it might be different than how the second hitter feels exactly. it. And I think that's something that, you know, if we're to kind of put the credibility back into the picture from working off the T for an hour lesson is our job is to give you as much information as possible so that you can have it click in your brain. Because what I always tell kids is the way I say something or the way I remember something is probably going to be different than the way they do it. And then we see a bunch of kids on a given day. So I think it's valuable to have all these tools and to have those different perspectives where breaking it down so that we spend that much time on a tee or that much time on front toss or whatever it might be ends up making a clearer translation than if we just tried to rush through it and make everybody the same. Sure. I think terminology is important too, right? We, they, they play for us here at the warehouse. They play for their high school teams. They may play for another club team, whatever it may be. Um, coaches have different, you know, verbal cues that they use that, they're different, but they mean the same thing. Right Now, maybe your high school coach says something one way, but it doesn't click with you. And I come in and say it a different way, but it means the same thing and it clicks. Right. Or vice versa. You know, I may say something to you over and over and you don't get it. Then your high school coach comes in and says something different. Or even another coach here who stops by and says something and says it differently. Now, all of a sudden, it clicks. Right. You know, so that's kind of our job to figure out what clicks with them. Of course. You know, and, you know, I think verbal cues are, are something that I've been trying to do a little more of. Um like this year, like we've been working with somebody and he, he's trying to really get into a, a deeper turn instead of drifting. So to him, I tell him, try to hit a homer to center, right? Because that's going to keep you in the center part of the field. But for you can't hit a homer to center if you're out on your front foot reaching. Yeah, you can get lucky and hit one with some good velo and backspin and stuff. But for you to really get it consistently, we really got to feel a better turn. So all of a sudden, like I'll get ready to flip the ball and I'll just say homer to center and you see a different swing. Right. You know, and all of a sudden it clicks with them. And now he takes notes down, he writes notes. And for him, he's like, that, that really helps me. You know, and when players start to tell me that helps them, it now helps me because now I know how to be better with them to know exactly what they're thinking. If maybe they need to make an adjustment somewhere and not feeling well. Right. And that, that question came to my brain too was when we talk about it in the context of how our job might be a little different than a high school coach. Do you think there's any value in, granted, we, we end up doing lessons with similar kids where so the guys that hit with you aren't the same guys that hit or pitch with me, but do you think there's some value in the structure that travel baseball and having facilities like this brings where we see different kids all the time, right? That high school coach might've been at that school for 30 years. He has the same group of kids for four years. Do you, th what kind of value do you think it brings to have a different face in the cage every hour that you're coaching and how that helps grow your game as much as it's our job to grow their game? No, I, I think it's important. And I think personally, like in my career, being able to hear different voices always helps. Um, everybody has a different perspective. You know, I learned a lot from, like I said, my dad first, you know, he was the one that taught me how to play, made me love the game at first. But then I, he said, you know, I'm done coaching you. You got to move on to hear some other, other voices. So, you know, I played here, I played in other organizations and a lot of these coaches have a lot of knowledge. It's how you take it in. Right. You know, or do you want to be a student of the game? Do you want to be able to say, you know, well, I learned that here and now I'm going to bring it to, you know, my next team, whether I'm going from middle school to high school or even high school to college, you know, my college coaches, I still talk to them this day and we yeah. bounce videos back and forth and theories. And we were at a, uh, a Labor Day party and um, we were trying to leave. I think uh, my baby was a couple months old at the time and it was like way past her bedtime. <laughs> and me and my coach were sitting in his garage, literally breaking down a load. For a half hour uh, and my wife thinks i'm crazy you right. know she's like wanting to leave and his wife's telling him like they gotta go they gotta go but like we're sitting there because we're so intense about trying to learn and feed off each right. other so you know I, I i love doing it i think it's great um you know giving back to the people that helped me and some of the coaches like coach blevins you yep. know current north brunswick coach was my hitting instructor when i was here you know so now it's funny that i'm sitting hitting here next to him and i was like man that was that was me 10 years ago yep. you know hitting with him you know, every week coming in and trying to learn and, you know, we play games and targets and me and my brother would come in together, you know, so being able to have different kids come in and, you know, me flipping a switch from having a senior in high school to now a freshman, yeah. you know, and how everything changes in our process where, you know, I'm seeing ball getting smashed off the tee or, or off BP or off the machine to now, all right, we got to go back to the tee or even just soft toss today, right. really to get them to start to make some feels or really make some adjustments in their swing. Yeah, it's awesome 
me being on this side now, it's still new to me, right? Where like you were coaching here when I was playing here, Joe was coaching here when I was playing here. And now to get to work alongside you guys, it's been awesome. Similar to what you're saying to just grow and like kind of take a look around every once in a while and say, holy cow, like this is pretty sick yeah. how it's developed. And to that end, like, I think what's really important there is as coaches, we have to continue learning the same way we're asking these kids to continue learning. And I think what you said about the different voices and allowing all of them to have the space and <laughs> to have the space in your mind where it's not like I have to listen to this guy because he's my high school or travel coach, or I have to listen to this guy because I hit with him on the weekends, that there's room for all of those. And if your mindset is to continue taking notes as a player so that you can have those cues in mind or to continue to listen to different kids that come in year after year, week after week as a coach, or even just take what your coach told you when you were a senior in high school and apply it to this kid that you're coaching hitting now. I think that's something that gets overlooked a little bit in my brain, at least that kids will think they have to do it one way when there's can be a huge benefit in having a ton of different voices and guys in your corner. Sure. I also think too, like guys will come in here, like say mid spring after being with us from, you know, all summer, all fall, all winter, and then playing their three month season in the spring. They're like, my coach is telling me to do this. Well, I said, well, try to understand what he's telling you. He's not wrong. Right. He may be saying it a different way, right? But try to understand, again, always be a student of the game, right? None of us know everything, right? So the more voices we hear, the more ideas, the more thoughts we put into play, the better player we can try to be, right? right? And I think sometimes players get stuck on, well, Coach E told me to do that, right? Or Coach Joe or Coach Hano said, oh, I have to do it this way. Well, that's the way we're trying to help you. But if your high school coach says, hey, try this, right? Don't be afraid to have a conversation with them. So, you know, when I was hitting in the winter, and again, we know a lot of these high school coaches around here, and I talk to them and say, hey, yeah, we've been working on this because you struggle with that. And a lot of them go, like, oh, I, I didn't really notice that because they don't really see them as long as we do throughout a year. Right. You know, they don't really get a chance to break it down. And I, I think that's another point I'll get to, right? But, you know, if we have that open line of communication from player to coach, right, and you're curious to ask why we're doing this, not – why? Because I think I know better, but it's why, because I want to learn, right? I think that's a better, a better way to go about it, right? But I was, what I was going to say is if, if these kids go from being here all year long, right? And they're so used to hearing one voice and then going back to hearing another voice, these coaches may not be able to say the same thing, right? And if they don't say the same thing, the players get discouraged. They feel like they wasted their time all winter, but we always have that communication going back and say, hey, you got to hear all voices. You can't just go in and say, this is the only thing I'm listening to. Right. Coach E knows everything about pitching. That's all I'm listening to. When I get to high school, I'm not listening to my pitching coach. Right. Right. Because that's only going to hurt you as a player. No doubt. You know, that, that why of, you know, curious of, coach, hey, I've been really working on staying in my backside before I get out front and go. And your coach wants you to go a little faster tell them that that's what you've been working on because you fall in trouble where your arm leaks out front and you're missing arm side up and in, you know, or whatever your mistake may be, you know, listening to both sides and having that genuine conversation, I think is important that player coach relationship. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And I think where that leads me train of thought wise is to like watching MLB guys. So I think it's interesting to hear how a player might be focused on listening to this coach or that coach, but then, on the off chance these days that they still get to watch an MLB game on TV or they get tickets to go sit in the stadium, they want to emulate these guys that are in the big leagues. So I think part of the problem with our game these days is not a lot of these guys come in and watch baseball. I know when I get guys for the first time, usually I ask them who their favorite player is and what team they root for. And it seems like more and more guys these days are saying, I don't really watch baseball. So not so much as it speaks to listening to different voices, but I think the connection is there where you want to emulate these guys that are at the highest level in our game. So we have to be able to listen to everybody that has a direct impact on us. But do you still think there's value in guys turning on the TV and watching Yes Network or SNY around here and seeing what Aaron Judge is doing or seeing what Pete Alonso is doing or Jacob deGrom or Garrett Cole if it's on the mound? Yeah, no, I think it is. I think it's important. Now, their game is a lot different than our game. You know, when we're talking about high school or even middle school guys that come in here, um, or even some of the college guys, still, so it's still way different. Um, there definitely is a lot of value in picking up little things, right? And I stress little things with our teams that I coach. I say little things win and lose games for you. We're not all going to hit the home run. We're not going to strike every batter out. Um, but I think 
like for me personally, I remember growing up, I was a first baseman. So when I would go to a Yankee game, whether it was Tino Martinez or Mark Teixeira, I used to like to watch their footwork, right? And watch how they moved around the bag and which way did they go on a hit? Did they go behind the runner? They go in front of the runner? Like I, I wanted to see what the best guys were doing. So when I was in the field, I was doing the same thing, right? Right. Not many times do, and you play low first base too, that at practice, coach is telling the first baseman what to do. Right. A lot of times the catchers are in charge, the catchers are calling plays, but, you know, little footwork things here and there make a, long, a big difference in the long run of where you should be, watching a guy miss the bag, making yep. sure you're there to be on a cutoff when the ball's hit to the outfield, the guy in scoring position, right? So little things like that, watching big leaguers do that, right? Watching how they attack a ground ball watching how they get behind a fly ball in the outfield, right? A lot of times these kids watch the game now and all they want to see is the guy hit a homer, right? Right. Or see the radar gun and on the, on the decal it says, um, you know, 99, but it lit, lights up in fire. Yep. Right. They want to see that, you know, or a hundred, whatever it may be. But I think there's a lot more to watch and, you know, going back to like these lessons and, and coming in and working on physical parts with these kids, I think the mental side we can spend double or triple the amount of time talking about, right? Like here, like we're talking, right, about the approach of hitting. Absolutely. Not just, oh, I want to be able to hit a double here. Well, we got to know what's coming. We got to know what the pitcher's doing. Right. We got to know his tendencies. We got we got to know what his velo is, when I got to get down. Um, but a lot of that is the approach side and the mental side. And you could see what people do when you watch them in the big leagues, right? Right. Um, you see what pitchers throw in certain counts. Right. There's a big guy up, you know, he wants the ball up or he wants the ball down so he can extend his arms. You see guys get two seams in on the hands so they can't do that. Right. Right. Now, again, if you're a catcher, right, you should watch that. Yeah. Right. You want to see like, like uh, John Carlos Stan, right. He wants the ball out because that's the way he's turned. He wants to extend his arms. Why he got hit in the face a couple of years ago. Yeah. Because guys are trying to run him in. So he can't do that. Now, as a catcher, I know a lot of times we call pitches here. That's another conversation <laughs> that we can get to. Um, we call pitches here based off what we're watching. But a lot of times when we play in a tournament, I get two games early to watch the teams we're going to play. So I have an idea of, okay, we're going to attack this guy this way. Right. right. I know we have a lefty on the mound. You know, he missed two change-ups this game. Big righty, we're going to throw him some change-ups. Yep. Right? Or is a big righty at the play and we have a righty on the mound, we're going to throw two seams in. Right? So if you watch baseball and you watch how guys attack hitters as a pitcher, as a catcher, or even learning as a hitter, what guys are going to do to you, right? You can learn a lot from that. Right. Maybe not so much the God given talent they have and how far they hit a ball. Cause you can't teach that stuff. These guys just have that. Um, but there definitely is a, a, a big benefit in watching the game. Yeah. And I think if, if you can be, if a guy can be focused on continuing to be a student of the game, I think that approach stuff comes so much easier. Because if you're just worried about, I know we have conversations with a lot of guys in the cage about the difference between looking really pretty doing it and doing it really well, right? Mm -hmm. So I think if your focus is on making sure I do the job really well, you're going to have to continue to keep learning because you're going to have to pick up new stuff all the time to continue to stay at a high level. But also developing that mindset where it's like, listen, on deck, I got to talk to the guy that just came in and see what the pitcher threw him. Where I got to watch this game. I have to be locked in in the field to know which hitter's up and where he's hit the ball previously. And I think even as it applies to maybe a lesson type setting where I got to take notes on my mechanics, that develops that mindset of can I continue to do this in the game and apply it to my success once we're going live on the field? Mm -hmm. And I think too, just to go back to your footwork piece, I think as a first baseman, I've said it before, it's the most underrated position on the field because guys is. will make web gems and the first baseman will dig it out and it's the shortstop's web gem. Yeah, they don't get any love. Yeah, no love. I know I used to get really fired up watching Eric Hosmer and Freddie Freeman go with that backside of the bag at first base where so they end up in feet. foul territory. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so I get that footwork thing, man. It definitely definitely clicks for me. And, and I, not to cut you off here, but I also think like for me, like when I was playing my first two years at Southern New Hampshire, I was a defensive replacement, right? I wasn't physically ready. You know, I never had the weight program that we have here at the warehouse now that Joe runs. Um, I wasn't physically ready to hit at that level, seeing some good pitching with a wood bat. It's a lot different. So I knew my role as a defensive replacement was I'm going to come in and make a play, right? Or I'm going to save something bad from happening. And I remember, I'll never forget this game in it. And we were playing down in Florida at uh, Lynn University, which is another nationally ranked team in the Division II level. And I believe it was man on second, one out, and it was a one-run game. 
Shortstop makes a backhand play, throws the ball to first, threw it kind of up the line. And instead of trying to pick it and hold the bag, I just remember just giving my body up and keeping it in front and the kid didn't score. Yep. Right. If I don't do that and try to make a web gem, right, that guy, that ball gets by me, he scores and now it's a different game. You end up winning that game, not to say because of that, but I knew my job of coming in. Now, again, I took a lot of pride in my role of being that defensive replacement. As much as I wanted to be a starter and play every day, I knew I wasn't ready. Right. Or maybe back then I thought I was ready. Right. But nowadays I could really say that. Yeah. You know, I knew I wasn't ready, seeing the level of play. And when I got to my chance to start, I knew that now I was ready. Yep. You know, so that footwork stuff is, you know, what I really worked on and, you know, try to help other guys as they came in after me, younger guys. Um, but to me, that was really important. Yeah, there's no doubt about the importance of that kind of thing. And especially considering that I don't think in that moment you're going through that thought process in your mind, right? That's something that happens instinctually. Mm -hmm. And to that end, what I want to touch on here is just like we're talking about our programs and whether it's the strength program or the lessons or the teams we do. I know something we do organization wise wide is our everydays mm -hmm. when it comes to defense. So whether it's outfielders, infielders, catchers, we give them the, that program where obviously we don't have to run through all the drills that we do with them. But my question is more along the importance of building that muscle memory and building those instincts up to say when the ball's coming right at me, forehand, backhand, over my right or left shoulder or straight over my head in the outfield, that I'm prepared to handle it. And it's not something I have to lose a step on because I'm thinking about it. So I know something we've heard a bunch is guys think, it, thinks, guys think that it gets monotonous and that it's the same thing all the time. And we're doing so many reps and we're using practice time doing the same thing for the first half hour. What do you have to say about that in the vein of building those instincts and building that muscle memory on the field compared to having to make it a conscious effort when the balls hit at you. Yeah. I think the everyday thing that we talk about, you know, they should be done every day Yeah, and they're done every day for a reason to, to really build that, you know, that feel, right. Just like we talk about hitting and making sure we're doing our T work. That's our T work on the field, right. Really making sure that, you know, my, um, my footwork is right. My hands are in the right position. That way, when it comes to a game, I don't have to try to force anything, you know, and I know it could be boring, right? But I always say, if you watch the big leaders, do they do it? Absolutely. Right. If you watch uh, the best time of year for these guys to watch is during spring training, right? So many videos come out with these, you know, um, uh, big league coaches, minor league coaches going through certain drills that they do with their guys. And a lot of times they do these every days that we talk about and, we're a little more restricted than the big leaguers. They're there every day. Yep. We have a couple of days of practice during the week, whether it's in summer or fall, um, even spring with our middle school guys. But if we can't do the basics, you can't expect to do it in a game. Absolutely. You know? So if we stress that now and in practice, right, it should be quick. It shouldn't take us a half hour to do our everydays. Right. Right. But the other thing is, do you do them at home? Right. As an infielder, you need a wall and a ball. Right. Or you have a, your, your sibling, your parent could flip you a, a one hop. Right. Anybody could do it. Right. So there's no excuse not to get better at it. So that way, when we get to practice, we don't have to spend that much time on it because you get your work in and now we can move on to something different. Right. You know, so I definitely think it is important as much as it could be boring at time or repetitive. It, it's the basics and the foundation of what we need to be able to do, do it in a game or do it in live speed. Absolutely. And the way I've always framed it in my mind is the same way, like it would be strange if we showed up to the practice field and we didn't go through our stretches or if I was a pitcher, I didn't do my bands. I think as a defender, there's got to be something similar in that vein too, where it's like, it, this is essentially my warm up, where I'm saying, I'm going to take this really seriously. So my body's in a good position that's to execute I, the way yeah, I want. That's why I compare it to T work. Of course. Right? It's, just, it's the same concept. then. Maybe guys don't view it that way. It's like, oh, I got to go do my pick series yeah. where I'm just flipping a ball at my partner. But if I'm really working on feeling the ball and getting the exchange from glo um, glove to uh, hand, right, I'm going to be really good at it now when we go do our multiple and actually get live ground balls. Right. Yeah, and I think there's no space in this game for, like, I want to rip through it really quickly. I think in general, one of my favorite quotes all time is repetition is the key to learning. And I think as that applies to baseball – it's, it's normally a little bit tougher from a pitching side because obviously we can't throw 100 yeah, pitch pitches every, every day, day yeah. right? But from a hitter's or a defender's perspective, there's no reason you can't go out there and throw yourself 100 ground balls off the wall and work on your picks. There's no reason you can't take 100 hacks in the cage. And what, what I'm sure you've noticed the same way I have is 100 swings goes by really fast when you've sure. got nobody else in there with you. 
Yeah. Well, I think the other thing too is like on the catching side, because I do a lot of work with our catchers is guys don't want to catch bullpens. Right. Right. There's no better way to really get live reps without being in a game than catching a bullpen. Right. Right. And sometimes it's better for a younger guy to catch an older guy. Right. Because if you can catch a guy throwing a little harder, right, and then you go back to your age group or your, your team, it's going to make it a lot easier. Right. So catching bullpens for me is one of the bigger things you could do. Right. As, as a catcher, especially that if I want to work on my, you know, receiving or I want to work on, you know, breaking balls in the dirt that I got to block. Yeah, we could sit there and toss you balls and, you know, work on your, your footwork or work on, you know, getting down. But nothing better than a kid ripping an 80 mile an hour slider. Absolutely. And I really got to block it live. Right. Right. Or working on your footwork on, you know, we, t- we tell our guys to do it all the time when, like, especially in the winter now when these lessons pick up, work on catching and getting to your throwing position. Whether right. Second or to third, right? Just work on it. Because now you're doing it off a live pitch where you got to really wait back. You still got to catch it in the zone. You can't just catch and get up or come through the ball. You're going to get killed if a batter was hitting. Right. Right. So getting those live reps, I think, are, are really important for these guys, even though it may be boring or, you know, they, they wear a ball off the neck or the shoulder because, you know, someone bounces a ball. Right. That's part of the position. Right. But if you can get really good at it now, now I got eight weeks worth of reps before my season starts. And I'm not, catching a ball live first for the first time when we get out in the field in March and it's 30 degrees out, you know, and I'm, I'm catching a bullpen there. Yeah, it's it's pretty – this isn't something that I had thought about before right now, but it's interesting to think about when we're covering defense and playing the infield and outfield and hitting and catching. All the stuff we talk about, you fall back on, well, it sounds boring, but if you want to be good, you have to do it. So the comparison that – comes to mind is like what's what's worse right we can either skip it and bat 150 and make 12 errors in a high school season or we can do the boring stuff on the front end so that we win a gold glove and we're first team all conference so i think that trade-off is something that that i know we've spoken to before in here but that yeah, i think it, that's the process value too and, and guys need to buy in you know and i think our program has yeah gotten a lot of guys to finally buy in you know, at first, I mean, I know when I first started, I was nervous. I didn't know what I was doing. Um, I actually had Coach Cole yep. um, as my assistant coach my <laughs> first year, uh, which is funny because he was one of my high school coaches. He coached me here at the warehouse uh, for, I think, two two falls. Um, but I relied on him on what to do. I know how to do it as a player, but as a coach on the other side, I didn't know. So to me, I, was like, I never wanted to do the boring stuff. I wanted to, oh, let's go hit five BP. Right, but no, let's go take them to the cage and do soft toss first. Yep. You know, let's 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 slow down. You know, so there's definitely a learning curve there and getting guys to buy in, I think, to saying, you know, this work is actually gonna help me. It's not just busy work while I'm here. And I think I try to compare a lot of the stuff that guys do here where, you know, to school, right? Yep. You go to school to class to learn, right? To get to get information, you take notes, right? That's our lesson. Right. And then all of a sudden, you know, you go home and you have homework. Right. I give guys homework here yep. saying, hey, you need to go practice this. I'm not saying you need to go to a field and hit, but you need to go work on your positions. You yep. got to go work on your movements. Right. And then all of a sudden your test in class is based off of your homework, your studying and the classwork to see how you do on the test. Our test is a game. Right. Right. How much work did you put in off the field on your own, whether it's you know at home, whether it's with taking a buddy to the field, whatever it may be. And now let's see how it you know executes in, in the game. Yeah, that, that comparison is great because if you're going to succeed in the classroom, everybody wants to be a high GPA guy and get good grades, but you can't just listen to what your teacher says and expect to go in on exam day and, and perform well. So it applies the same like you're saying, where if I practice and I prepare the right way in a baseball setting, then I can expect to succeed on the field. And granted, it's not always going to happen the same way it does in the classroom, I'm sure. But trusting that preparation is is the important part and if we can get after it here we can kind of take that pressure off our shoulders when it comes game time Mm -hmm. i think the school uh the school reference brings up a good segue because as details detailed as we've been so far this isn't all that you do as Mm -hmm. as good as as good at it as you are full-time job at rutgers university you got a family with with a young daughter and another one on the way speaking to a guy like me in a young coach's position how are you able to manage all that stuff and find the balance? I know one of my big worries right now is as I'm finishing up grad school, I'm 
interested in what the next step might look like because I love this stuff and I don't want to have to give it up to go on with the rest of my life. So what does that look like from your perspective where you're able to handle all these things and succeed at all these things at the same time? Um, well, I think it all started um, my senior year. We were in a regional tournament um, and Mike Arlotti was there um, recruiting. There was a couple good pitchers there in that tournament. So um, I got a chance to see him before one of the games and I, I knew I wasn't a draft guy. You know, I, I knew I hit my peak in college. I wasn't going to get drafted or signed or anything. So he kind of told me. And, you know, the good thing about Mike, he's always honest. You know, he's, right. I had that conversation with him going into my senior year. And I asked him, I said, hey, do you think, like, I can play at the next level? And he shot me straight and pretty much said, like, you know, we'll see. You know, he didn't want to, like, kill my dreams. Of course, but, like, of course. He, he let me down lightly and said, yeah, maybe, maybe this is, you know, your, your end point. You know, and... You know, I took it like, all right, and then I got to really make sure I have a blast this last year. Um, but he, what he did tell me was, you know, when you're done playing and you come home, like, I want you to come work with us. So to me, getting a job obviously was important. Have student loans got to pay back. Yep. Um, but I always wanted to do something in sports. You know, so the fact that I had the opportunity to come here, this is, I think, my seventh year now at the warehouse. So, you know, it's been different every stage, you know, um, me and my wife um, got together, I think, like my third or fourth year of coaching, and we've been together ever since. Obviously got married, um, bought two houses now, moved <laughs> away, came back here to North Brunswick. Um, but it's definitely tough. You know, obviously I got the job right out of school. Um, I was actually coaching at Old Bridge High School for a couple of years, um, volunteering there, and then coming here to practice or game. Um, so my schedule's been kind of hectic. Um, and I think my wife would agree. Um, but you know, to me, I, I look at everything as a challenge, right. And okay. I know today I have to go to work all day and then I got four or five lessons and, you know, and then I got to go home, you know, now my wife was either working too, and, you know, we got to get the baby ready for bed, got to feed her, got to get her ready for the next day. So a lot of preparation work goes into it and planning out our weeks. And, you know, we're really good at communicating and what we have and, you know, she works two or three jobs as well, you know, and some of them are part time, some of them are on the weekend. So, you know, she does like weddings. So she right. works as a coordinator. So there's a Saturday where she's gone from eight to eight or 10 to 10. She's gone all day. I know personally, I can't plan a practice. I can't plan a, a workout or a, a hitting or catching, whatever it may be. Um, but I think preparation and having that schedule and being able to spend quality time with them. You know, but again, this is also a passion of mine that I love that it's really hard for me to give up yep. just like flipping a switch, even though, you know, I love my family and I want to spend time with them. Um, but there obviously will be a time where I can't be in here every night, right. you know, from, you know, right when I get out of work, I grab a slice of pizza and come here until 10 o'clock. Like as my kids get older, I won't be able to do that as much. But, right. you know, for me, this is a passion of mine. I never wanted to give it up. And, you know, I love doing it. So we make it work. Right. You know, we definitely make it work. I think what comes to mind right away is I've, I've talked to a lot of people just going through school who have said, you know, there's a lot of talk about this work life balance. But then the flip side of that is there's people that say, well, if you find things that you love to do, you never really feel like you're working. So which side of the spectrum do you tend to fall on? Is this something that feels more like the life part of the work-life balance or is this something where it's like listen i love everything that i get to do so it, none of it feels like work so i think i break it down into three things i think it is i have work which is my job at Rutgers. yep this is another job but i don't look at it as a job this is fun right right but then i also have my social life with my family and my friends and stuff like that so when i break it down all three it's not just you know work and life i have three things right because i don't look at this as a job Right. You know, and, and people ask me, oh, you got to get paid for this. I'm like, yeah, but like, this is fun. Yeah. Like this is, I don't come here and like, oh, I got to go sit at my desk today. Yeah. Like, no, this is fun. I get to work with guys who are as passionate or trying to be passionate about something they love, whether they're young or old and seeing them succeed is great. Right. You know, like Jay Harry, right? Jay yeah. Harry at Penn State shortstop. Um, me and him have built this great relationship over the years because he was just as passionate as I was, you know, about getting better. And we'd be in here. He'd call me at 10 o'clock at night. Hey, you want to come to the warehouse? Because he wanted to hit. Yep. Right. And sometimes I, I wanted to go, but I knew like, hey, you know, I'm hanging out with my wife or I'm in bed sleeping, or anything, <laughs> whatever it may be. Um, but like to me, it wasn't like, oh, I got to go. I got to go work tonight. Right. Like this is I get to go to the warehouse and play. And I think for guys, too, when they come here, it's not 
I have a lesson tonight or I have practice tonight. No, I get to go to practice. You know, having that mindset, I think, is huge for these guys to really see, you know, how they progress, not just in baseball, but in life. Right. Like, yeah, your job's going to be important one day. I get to go to work. Some people are still looking for jobs, yep. right? And you come out of school and, you know, everybody says there's a lot of jobs out there, but you apply and you never hear back. You know, you could be a great student. You could be really good at, you know, what you studied. But if someone's not hiring, you don't have a job. Of course. Right? You can't pay the bills. You can't pay these things as you get older. And I'm starting to do that now, obviously, you know, having a house and car payments, insurance, all this kind of stuff that, yeah, the money here helps. But to me, I don't look at it like I'm doing it for the money. Right. Right. And I'm not just saying that to be a nice guy, but like I love coming here. Yeah. Like I get I get excited that I'm leaving work and, you know, I got four guys I get to hit with today, you know, who are texting me. Hey, can I come in this week? Hey, can I come in this week? Like if they're excited, I'm definitely excited. Yeah. You know, so there's definitely a balance that you got to have. Um, and for you, like you're right there, like about to make a next that next switch of, you know, when you're done with school, what's your next step? You know, I, my suggestion for you is. Yeah, you need a job, you know, but try to do something that you enjoy, right? Because you don't want to do something that you hate and you're sitting there and you're like, you know, I wish I can go to practice tonight, but I'm working in the city and I will never get back in time to even coach right. or do a lesson. So as much as the job is important and we need it, you know, try to find something that you really enjoy. Yeah. You know? Thanks, man. Yeah, I really appreciate that perspective because I think we've talked a bunch on the pod before about the get to versus have to type of mentality. Mm -hmm. And for me personally, and I think, or at least I hope, I don't know if I'm in a position to give advice at all, but I hope as it applies to young coaches in general, I had never thought to apply that get to mentality to the rest of my life. I had always applied the get to mentality to just the coaching side or the baseball side, whatever capacity it might have been in. So I definitely appreciate that. And it kind of Let's me take a deep breath a little bit thinking that, you know, I can set it up in such a way like you have where yeah. you get to say, I get to go do this every day, no matter if it's at home or at work or at the warehouse. here. Yeah, I can give you a quick story, too. It's actually um, my first job interview. Right? And I don't know if I told you this off the air, um, but I had um, a, a marketing job that I went to and um, the interview was there was like 15 of us. All, right, all sitting there in suits, you know, with a little like briefcase, you know, trying to look professional. And again, I didn't know what I was getting into. It was my first interview. And I said, even if I bomb it, it's good experience for me. Right. Um, so for me and for you, probably, I don't know, as, as a college baseball player, you don't really have time in the summer to get an internship. Yep. Definitely don't have time in the spring because we're traveling. And even in the fall, our, cra our schedules are crazy. So when, when I sat in with the, um, with the manager, the hiring manager, He's looking at my resume and he says, I see here you haven't done any internships. And I said, well, unfortunately and fortunately, I played college baseball. And to me, I've learned so many life lessons throughout baseball that helped me become who I am today. I said, I learned how to fail. Right. I learned how to work as a team. I learned how to be a leader. You know, and he said, I know here you're a captain and you put it on your resume. I said, yeah, I learned how to be a leader with 40 guys. Right. And my senior year, our head coach ended up getting a job at Oklahoma. So he left maybe three, four weeks before our season started, right? It was a big hit to us. Now we let, we right. lost our head coach. So the guys were all talking. We all rallied up together and said like, Hey, this is what we need to do. We still have our same vision and our same goals in mind. Right. But me and the other captains had that leadership to do that. Right. So as I explained that in the interview, the hiring manager was like, Whoa, right. Like, we want guys to go get jobs in the field. And, you know, to me, I always say like, yeah, I'm your errand boy. I go get you coffee. I go right. scan your files, which, yeah, it looks good on a resume. But what did you learn? Right. Right. So, again, I learned more about myself doing that and the life lessons that taught me to become who I am today and allow me to view things in a certain way that maybe if you didn't deal with failure. Right. Because what, what other thing in life could you do, you know, well, we call it 300, hitting yeah. 300, but 30% of the time and be good at it, Yep. right? You can't go to basketball and shoot 30% from the free throw line and be good, nope. right? You can't get a 30 on a test in school, right? You right. can't do 30% of your work in, in, in your job and be really good. Of course. Right, but in baseball, you learn how to fail seven out of 10 times. It teaches you a lot about yourself. So I think for me, that was, that was huge. And when I said that on the interview, the guy offered me a job right there. That's awesome. I never took it because it wouldn't <laughs> allow me to do this. Yep. You know, it, was, it was more of an experience thing for me. But <clears throat> like I said, it helped me with you know, interviews I had later and eventually helped me get the job at Rutgers. Yeah, I, and I appreciate that too because I, 
the piece that I'm realizing now, it hasn't clicked in my brain thus far, is just how to relate all of this baseball stuff to the rest of what life brings to the table. So I, like for me personally, and again, I, it, maybe it applies to other guys that are in a similar situation to, to uh, the one I am. It's cool to see you talk about how everything you've learned from baseball can be applicable and can make you successful in the other stuff that, that life's going to put on your plate as you move forward here. So I think too, what comes to mind is talking about next steps, right? We, we talk to a lot of high school kids that are going through the recruiting process and coming back to, you know, like what life throws at you, what life has thrown at these kids recently has been huge social media influence. So I know we talk all the time about how kids seem to make commitments these days or go through their recruiting process, hoping for more likes on Instagram or more follows on Twitter. So going from talking about the next step as a kid that's coaching to the next step that kids are in high school take to their college careers. What's the best advice that you give guys these days about picking a school that's the right fit for them? Um, so we, we, one thing that we do here is we have our exit meetings, um, which I think is really important for us, not just with the player, but with the parents. Yep. Um, Cause I think the parents have a lot of influence on what their kids do. Um, so we sit down, we sit down actually in this room right here and kind of go through their ability and what they did on the field, you know, good or bad and what they need to work on. But then we talk about like their future plans um, and we get them to come up with uh, a plan about how, if they're really interested in playing in college, you know, one, they have to work at it. Yep. You know, we can always get better and make sure that we can make a team, you know, because there's not a lot of the percentages are obviously really low from playing in high school to making a, a college team. Um, but we come up with like a list of them saying, all right, here are the schools that, you know, we think that you fit into, you know, and, you know, I want you to do your research. You know, what kind of school are you looking for? Are you looking for a big school that, you know, has footballs on Saturday and you get to go to the game and, and with, your, with your friends, your teammates, whatever it is, or are you looking for a smaller school? Um, do you want to go far or do you want to stay close by? Um, how expensive is the school? Can you afford to go to that school? Um, so there's a lot of different um, ways that we tell them to start looking into schools. And I think for the parents, they're the ones that really help them do that because, again, Kids don't necessarily know the financials of how much they could afford and, you know, how much they need to take out in a loan or, you know, if they're lucky enough that the parents could help them pay through school, it's even better. Um, but, you know, one of the other things that we tell them to do is come up with a list of pros and cons. You know, if you start seeing a school that you like and maybe the coach is interested in you, but you don't really like them, maybe it's not the best fit, right? Yes, you want to play, but if you don't like the school, you don't want to go there if you're going to be miserable for four years. Um, but... I think the, the mutual side that we, we try to get to is you got to want the school as much as they want you. Absolutely. And that's usually where you find your best fit. Right. I had a couple situations where I had three offers out um, or two offers at one time. And financially, obviously, I needed the help. You know, I wasn't a 4.0 student. I was like a 3.2, 3.4 student. So I had decent grades, but I wasn't going to get a ton of money academically. Um, but they offered me full rides. Now, to me, my eyes lit up, you know, because I thought it was the best thing in the world. Like, oh, I'm getting a full ride to go to school. But to me, I wasn't going to be happy at the schools because when I made that list of what I was looking for, they, they weren't there right. for what I wanted. Um, so going back to Southern New Hampshire, I got a call coming back from a tournament. And, you know, to me, I never heard of it, never, never knew anything about them. You know, but the coach saw me play first, saw me play third, and saw me pitch, right, all in one game. Awesome. You know, so it was really cool that yeah. it just happened to work that way. You picked the right game time. to come to. Exactly. You picked the right game to come to. And I did well. I think I had two hits or something. Um, and I kind of blew them off at first. You know, I was like, I don't want to go to New Hampshire. I never knew. I knew New Hampshire as a state. I didn't know what it was. I didn't know they played baseball up there. Um, this is me being, you know, a high school kid not knowing stuff. But then I remember my mom said, you should call him back. You know, and I did. And we took a ride up there and I loved it. And it checked off all those boxes that what I was looking for. Um, and for me, it was the perfect fit, you know. And I think guys now that have come through here have all seen how if you're looking to play, right, we got to find that perfect fit. Right. You know, we got to find that mutual agreement that they want you as much as you want them. You can't want them more because you don't want to go to school that you make a team, but you'll never play. Right. You know, so it is a long step and everybody has their own path. There's no, you know, one way to do it. Um, we try to give them as much information as possible. Um, we tell them to put a video together. We have a, a template for a letter that they can send to coaches via email. 
Um, so it's a long process. Um, and like I said, everybody's different, but some guys sign early, some guys sign later. Yep. And there's nothing wrong with either one. You know, and I think for them, seeing it on social media that their friends or their teammates or classmates are signing, but they're like, well, I don't really have any interest yet. It's okay. Right. Don't feel like you have to be like everybody else. You know, I didn't sign until my senior year. Right. Right. Some kids, some kids now are signing at eighth grade. Yeah. Right. I just saw a ranking the other day for 2028s, which are seventh graders. Yep. Like, why are there rankings for seventh graders right now? What does that do? It doesn't help the kid become a better player, right? It just shows that, oh, I'm on perfect game. Yep. I'm on PBR. Now, again, those events are great. We go to them. Yeah. Know, they're good tournaments. They're, the PBR does a, um, a, a workout for us, which is great for our players. But, you know, sometimes these kids look too much into that, and I think it hurts their progression as a player, and it makes them be like, well, I guess I'm not good enough to play. Meanwhile, you have plenty of time. Right. You know, and I think they need to kind of take a step back from – being so excited to post, um, blessed and honored to, to come exactly. into the school, you know, everybody starts that. It's like a template they have. For <laughs> yeah, that, you yeah. Know? I'm blessed and honored to go to this school. Well, you know, instead of saying, you know, yeah, I signed, but you know what? I got to go to my gym session instead of going to my signing party. Yeah. You know, like I got to go work out. You know, your work has just begun now that you exactly. signed. Um, so again, everything's different. Everybody has their different path. Um, social media is good and bad. You know, you can you can learn a lot from it. You can take some good information, but I also think a lot of it is hurting the kids and saying like, all I want to do is say I'm posting to go somewhere, yep. versus actually like loving a school or having that mutual connection with the coach saying this is going to be a good fit for me. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I want to be careful here in in my take because I don't I don't want to come off as saying it's a it's a detriment automatically if you're a kid that signs early or commits early or I don't even want to say it's a bad thing to make that post because that's an awesome time in a kid's life. It's a great life. achievement for sure. Right, of it course. Is. If it's the right the right way. Exactly. You know, right. if you take time to actually go through the process, make sure that this is the fit. You know, sometimes you got to go see four or five schools, sometimes you got to see two schools. Right. Right. If you're later in the process and you only really seen two schools, then you can pick from those two schools. If you know that one you're really in love with, you know, that's the one you really want to go to. Right. But some guys, it takes 10 schools to see, you know, through when my brother was in college, I was set on going to Montclair because that's where he went. Yeah. Right. They play at a, a stadium. You know, it's a pretty cool setup. I was like, that's where I'm going. Their coach wanted me to play outfield. Right. I've never played outfield <laughs> in my life. So to me right there, it wasn't a fit. You know, but it shot my dreams down because that's where I wanted to go because that's where my big brother went. Right. You know, but it didn't work out that way. And I'm glad it didn't because I'm really happy with my experience and where I ended up going. Yeah, I think your point about you have to want the school as much as they want you is really important. We talk about that fit all the mm -hmm. time. And I think if you want the school as bad as they want you, that's going to bring you to what I think is paramount in the whole recruiting process is finding a place where you have an opportunity to contribute. Mm -hmm. I think that's what has to take precedent over where am I ranked, right? I know what my dad always said to me growing up was, do you want to be the best 12-year-old, the best 18-year-old, the best 24-year-old, the best guy in the big leagues, right? And you can telescope that out as far into the future as you want. But I think the perspective is important where even if I'm a kid that commits as a freshman and signs early, like you're saying, the work has just begun. That doesn't bode towards anything that my college career might offer. And then if I'm a kid that's tearing it up my freshman year of college, I still have to get to at least my junior year before I can become a pro. Mm -hmm. So I think those rankings, as cool as they are for the kid, right? If they're used as fuel, that's the proper way to do sure, it. And sure. then the commitment is the same way, right? Like you're saying, the work has just begun. So if you can handle it the right way and it's done properly, like you're saying, then that is the coolest thing because that's the goal for everybody to make it to the next level. Sure. And we see that like in games too where um... – a lot of times we go to tournaments like rosters are posted and we look to see, oh, they have four commits. Right. Right. Now all of a sudden we look at the field and we see that kid like they're the best player of all time. But we have four commits too. Yeah. And you know, they're your best friend. You don't look at them any different. You know, they're, they're human just like all of us. So um, I also think for us when we have commits on our team and we have younger guys come in, they look up to them. Yeah. Right. And I think as a, an older player or someone who is committed, you have to know you have eyes on you. Right. I have kids coming in to hit and someone's coming in to lift after or they sit there and watch them. Right. Like the other day, Julius Rosado was in here, you know, committed as a freshman going to Rutgers. There was uh, a group of lifting that came after that just all stood there and watched him hit. 
right? Because they want to do what he's doing. They want to achieve their goal too. He achieved his at a young age, right? It's very different, but he did, right? But now other guys are starting to be like, oh, watch, I want to watch him, right? Or I show video of what he did, right? Now, again, he's one of the harder workers we have, yep. right? Him and his dad will go to the field in 20 degree weather to get ground balls, but he knows his job has just begun. His work has just begun, you know? So it takes a lot of responsibility if you do that at a younger age and guys start to look up to you and you got to set a good example. And again, comes back to what I was saying. It teaches you a lot about yourself and how you handle yourself when eyes are on. 100%. And I think that's the flip side of the coin here is as much as there can be some detriment to all of it, if you let your head get too big and if it gets away from you, guys like that who want to continue to work and understand what it took them to get to this point and how that same mindset is going to help them continue to grow they've earned it right Mm -hmm. so they've earned those eyes being on them and i think with that work ethic comes the understanding that i need to continue to push and i need to continue to earn it the same way i've earned getting to this point i need to earn getting to whatever heights i want to reach Mm -hmm. and i know like the guys will come in and watch julius now or they'll watch zach on the pitcher's mound like when i was that age this guy who's above our heads brandon belak was in here and i would come in at eight o'clock in the morning on a Sunday and he was back there lifting or whatever. I, I would hang out here and watch every bullpen he threw or through or as many as I could I still do that now when he comes yeah, in, I sit back here and watch his pitches and stuff. I'm like, I can hit that. No, I can't. You know? like, <laughs> no, I can't. Absolutely. I tell him I could and he, he kind of shakes me off. Yeah. Like, right. He's like, yeah. Right. I'm but, sure everybody tells yeah, him that. Yeah. Right. Um, but yeah, I think we're fortunate enough here in our setting that we you know, as much as we'd like to take the credit, we end up with guys that regardless of the role we've played, just are awesome role models for the younger guys coming up and are awesome people to like look at and point to and say, listen, like a guy like a Brandon Belak who's come through our system and works out here and now he's pitching in the big leagues. It's awesome to see those guys and to be able to, you know, point to people that we know personally, like you're saying, like this guy's a big leaguer. Mm-hmm. He's just he's just the he's just the guy thrown in the middle lane at the warehouse, or he's yeah. just the guy that's back there lifting. Mm-hmm. So we're super fortunate through all of this stuff. You know, we we want our guys to be good so bad, and we want our guys to end up in the right situations at the right schools and the right places. That it we I feel like we sometimes tend to put a little bit of a negative lens on things just because we want to stay away from that stuff. But it's yeah. cool to sit back here and kind of reflect and say. We've had some cool stuff, and we've had some awesome guys come through this program. Yeah, too. at the end of the day, when you sit back and look at it, you're like, wow, this kid's playing here. Actually, the best example is if you go back to the warehouse and look at the back wall, right? Joe puts up logos of everybody who's come through our program that are now at playing in the college level. Yep. Our whole wall is filled up. He has to start a new wall now. Right? That's really cool. You yeah. know, it's a great accomplishment for the warehouse, not for us individually, but as for a warehouse and a program You know that – we're fortunate enough to have these guys come in and buy into, you know, the full season, not just come in for, you know, the summer and play with us, but to be in here during lift during, you just played a seven inning game in high school, seven o'clock at night, but you're here lifting, Yep. you know, so buying into that whole program and, you know, sit, stepping back now. And um, Joe came in what, eight, nine years ago now Yeah. around then and seeing how the program has progressed to what it is today. Um, it's definitely awesome to see. Yeah, I think that that puts a bow on everything pretty nicely where it's kind of like that. How you do something is how you do everything where it's been cool for me to come up where I I hit it at a really cool time where I got to play as we were growing. And now I get to see this continued growth from a coaching perspective and to see how our guys and our athletes have grown in a similar fashion to how the baseball warehouse has grown, whether it's the addition of teams or the weight room going up back there, lessons exploding the way they have. So it's been really cool to be a part of and to see our guys grow the way the way we have as a institution, for lack of a better term, sure. um, it's been it's been awesome to be a part of. So, just to wrap up here, man, I want to give a big shout out to your Coach Hondo BW Instagram page. I know um, we're talking about getting in the right positions and breaking down our fundamentals and seeing ourselves do things the right way. And you've you've put out some awesome content in the early going here with that account. So just. Uh, I know you put up a post the other day saying there's a ton of video coming this off season. So give the people the lowdown on, uh, on what that's yeah, going to be so about. Yeah, so again, I, I debated doing this because I see a lot of accounts out there. And, you know, for me, it's more about trying to expose our guys to, you know, it's nothing personal on my end. Like, I'm not trying to say I'm the best hitting coach out. Come hit with me. Uh, but I think it's more for showing the guys, for them too, like 
they love to see it. We talked about it before. They love the Instagram and social media, but, you know, seeing guys progress, I think is huge, you know, seeing where their swing was last winter to this winter. So I started it last winter. I probably had like 15 posts, but, you know, I already started putting a lot of guys who want to come in early now in the winter and get their work in, you know, and trying to see how much better they've gotten, you know, and, and the best for me will be like later on going back to seeing a video from their freshman year they're not looking at it as a senior and putting it side to side yep. and saying, look where you've become, you know, has nothing to do with me. It's, this is what you've been doing. You know, I think the last thing I'll leave it at, and I tell this to every lesson and we've talked about it in practice. And I always ask the question to these guys, who's your best coach. All right. And the best answer I get is me. Yep. Right? And I laugh at them when I say, guess what? <laughs> Thank you. But it's not me. Right. right. And they look at me like I'm crazy. Like that's what they probably thought I wanted them to say that, but it's not. And then they realize they say, Oh, myself. I said, at the end of the day, I could try to help you. I can give you all the advice in the world, give you everything I may know, but you're the one that has to do it. You know, so this, these posts that I'm putting out, you see these guys working on stuff. You see them, okay, if I took a bad swing here, I won't make another bad swing on the next one. And yep. I make my adjustment right away. That's them coaching themselves. Because when they get to high school, they don't necessarily have the time or a coach doesn't have the time to break down everybody's swing, right? They're, you got your round of eight, next guy's up. Right now, if you're being your own best coach and you can make your own adjustments, now all of a sudden you can be a better player. Right. Right. And Coach Joe always uses the best line. He said, good hitters make adjustments game to game. You know, really good hitters make adjustments at bat to at bat. But the best hitters make it pitch to pitch. Yep. Right. And it's a great line. And we use it. We especially tell our younger guys when they're coming up, you know, especially when we get into their first practice sessions and hitting, you know, they'll come in and take eight bad swings in a row and never change anything. You know, but all of a sudden, once they start to realize I got to start to fix it on my own, coach can't stop practice for everybody just for me. Of course. That's when they start to, to learn more and, and really apply the stuff that we're trying to teach them. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I think that being able to, to see your adjustments on video, because I know you've had that conversation before too, where it's impossible for you to see yourself yeah. while you're hitting. So I think that's really valuable. I think giving these guys some, some extra eyes on them, using social media as the platform to do it is a great thing to do. So it's, it's a really cool idea you got there, and I'm, I'm excited to see, uh, to see it grow and see these guys get their work in and see their progress throughout the offseason here and then season to season. So if you guys want to check that out, you can find Hondo at, at Coach underscore Hondo underscore BW on Instagram. And uh, I can't thank you enough for coming on, man. It's been a great conversation. Yeah, Thanks for taking on. the time. Like I said, I've listened to every episode, so. I was waiting for that phone call to come on because uh, I think it'd be nice to hear the hitting side and stuff like we talked about today. So thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for talking some hitting. Thanks for chopping it up. And, uh, and I really appreciate you coming on. Yeah, no problem. For Hondo Diaz and for the Green Grass and White Bases podcast, I'm your host, Eric Reardon. We're signing off. It's one, two, three strikes, you're out at the old ball game.